Okay. It's my turn. Um, I'm going to skip the scripture reading. Uh, that was the sermon that he was going to preach. So, here's mine. I have two dogs. One of them came from um, Bob and Alice. I think she's 13 now. Or 12. What is she doing? She's 12. She's 12. <clears throat> Actually, I would say she's my dog. She was intended to be my dog, but somehow she's his dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say our dog, Jody, has trust issues. Every time we go outside, she hesitates in the door and has to make certain that it is open still and that I am standing to the side. This is because of the one time when, as a puppy, in a rush to get the door closed in the winter cold, I caught her tail in the door. <laughs> she has never forgotten, and she does not trust me not to do it again. I can't blame her. I would feel the same way. And thankfully, it does not affect our relationship until it's time to go outside. My other dog, Ernie, however, has much deeper trust issues. He's a rescue dog with intense distrust of men in general. He will not allow a strange man anywhere near him. If forced, such as if I catch him and hold him so that the man can touch him, he will have an intense anxiety reaction, which consists mainly of me getting a wet shirt. <laughs> At some point in his life, a man has traumatized this 12-pound dog to the point that he will not even allow David, who has lived with him for all of these months, almost a year now, won't let him touch him unless I'm holding him. Sometimes, once or twice, he's jumped up in David's lap, realized where he was, and scampered away. <laughs> when I'm not home, he will not go outside with Jody when David lets her out. He'd rather hold it and wait for me to get back then trust David. This not only truly saddens me that someone has been so horrible to a small, innocent dog, but it also puts me on a mandatory schedule. I've got to be back in time to let him out or repercussions occur. He must be let out around 4 o'clock by me and no one else. Whoever it was that brutalized him has affected him for life. Ernie even has also PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. He's gotten much better, but there at first he would spring out of bed and run barking frantically into the living room in the middle of the night. I would go to him and he would start and jerk as he woke up. He was asleep when he was doing it. He'd been sleep barking. <laughs> he still growls and whimpers in his sleep, but it is nothing like the manic sleep disorder thing he exhibited those first few months that he was with us. Trust is a fragile thing. I recently shared a Facebook quote that reads, Trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. Indeed, seconds to break, such as a tail call in the door, or a betrayal by a friend or a co-worker. Have you all ever had that happen? <laughs> Trust is so very fragile, I am reminded of a time when, as a child, curious and daring, I had climbed up onto the cabinet to see what was on the top shelf where Mother had placed special, mysterious things out of our reach, for a very good reason, as it turned out. There I found a lovely crystal sugar bowl. This very bowl. It was cut crystal and had a cute I lifted it off the shelf to look at it better, and to my horror, the lid slipped off and fell to the cabinet, breaking into pieces. I was devastated. I still am. The crystal sugar bowl had been a wedding gift for Mother and Daddy. It was a treasure that she had kept safe, irreplaceable. Yet it might have been glued back together again. I mean, we can take duct tape and put on it if we wanted to. But that's not going to fix it. 
it will still be broken. The crack would always be there even if we glued it. It's not as it was. It is broken. It is no longer whole. Trust as is fragile as a crystal sugar bowl. Trust can be regained with a lot of effort and divine help, but the crack will always be there. How does one trust again when trust has been shattered? I've known people who have been through infidelity. Who, how do they ever trust the straying spouse again? They don't, not fully. That delicate bond has been cracked forever. I've had friends turn their back on me as a child and as an adult. I've been lied about by people whom I never would have thought would betray me. People I looked up to. People I respected. That is when it hurts most. That feeling of betrayal. When I read and hear about the Last Supper, I wonder how much Christ, how must Christ have felt when he watched Judas leave the room to go and do his dark deed. At least Jesus knew. Not that it hurt any less, perhaps. Divine in his foreknowledge and yet human in knowing that someone close to him had sold him, betrayed him. Abandonment is another example of the casualty of trust. I can remember two instances when I felt abandoned and lost. The first occurred before I was seven. My family was at a drive-in movie in Mineola, I think. I had to go to the restroom and was allowed to go by myself. But when I came out, the movie had ended and the cars were all leaving. To my horror, I saw my car driving past, leaving me. In absolute panic, I ran screaming for my daddy to stop and wait for me. They had forgotten that I was not in the back seat. I can still feel the echo of that frightening feeling of being left alone in a strange place. Daddy did stop and I was rescued, but the feeling lingers. Did I lose trust in daddy? No but I made sure I wasn't left behind again. The other time occurred when I was older and my grandparents, Garner, took me with them to visit Grandma's sister in Dallas. My cousin, who lived with my grand, my great aunt, took me walking to a new store called Walmart. <laughs> I had never been to a Walmart before. It was brand new. It was huge. As Daddy would have said, one could certainly put a lot of hay in here. <laughs> But while there, my cousin met some friends and completely ignored me as she talked with them. I continued to explore the store myself. Yet when I returned to where my cousin had been, she was gone. Okay, I can find her. She must have been looking for some specific thing. She's on the next aisle. I went down aisle after aisle after aisle looking for her. She was not there. I began to become frightened. I was in Dallas. Dallas. Huge, big, scary Dallas. I had no idea of how we had gotten to the store. Walked, yes, but even then I was directionally challenged. I continued to round the store, searching every aisle and beginning to weep in fear until I rounded a corner and saw my grandfather. He was the best sight I think I have ever seen. I ran to him, my rescuer, my very worried savior. My cousin, for whatever reason, had gone home and left me alone in the store. I still do not understand why, but I was found. I was safe. Joy replaced fear. Fear is bound up in the cracking of trust. Sometimes it serves to make us cautious, as with Jody in her tale. In Ernie's case, his traumatic past may cause trust to never be repaired, like a completely shattered crystal lid. People are fallible. I, in particular, am very sensitive to harsh words or action. I want to trust, and I generally do. In fact, sometimes I have certainly been too trusting. I've had to learn lessons. There have been times when I should have known better. My Uncle Max had a full-blood Brahma bull. And here I was going to congratulate you on your <laughs> success. This one was named Booger Red. What's your name? Uh, King. King. Well, Booger Red thought he was king. He was a pet. Now, my daddy had always said that one should never make a pet out of a bull. They will lose respect for humans. Yet, Booger Red was so gentle. He loved to have his ears and head scratched, just like some giant dog. On that summer day, I was sitting on the edge of the pickup truck, and Booger Red had his big old head in my lap, 
enjoying my fingers running across his face and ears. He did love attention. However, I grew tired of scratching his big old head, and my fingernails were getting full of dirt, which I don't like. So I stopped and pushed his head away. He, however, was not through with me. He swung his head determinedly back, horns and all. One horn caught me across the abdomen as he knocked me over backward into the pickup bed. I had a bright scratch and was relatively un uninjured. Frightened, yes, but there was no blood. Yet I did not ever trust the bull again. As an adult, I have foolishly trusted and as a result have been taken advantage of. My aunt gave me a balancing bird, which I decided to take to school for the students to enjoy. I thought it would be fun to place it around the room and experiment with balancing it on various surfaces. Someone must have liked it a lot because he or she stole it. And it was from my aunt. It was special to me. Another time I gave a student a copy of my own detailed notes with which to study for an upcoming test. I seated student in a quiet place away from the others so student could study undisturbed as I continued with the rest of the class. Unknown to me at the time, student took pictures of the notes with student's cell phone and shared them with a couple of friends. It was a very conspicuous thing when they all made 100s <laughs> on the test. Yes, they retook the test or accepted a zebra. I may have been too trusting, but I'm not completely stupid. But I also learned a valuable lesson acknowledging in the accuracy of the rules against cell phone use in the classroom. Guys, that's one reason we don't want you to have them. There are many, many times when one should not trust. In fact, I think that one of the hardest, most painful things we face in dealing with other people involves trusting. Secrets are opportunities for hurt. How many times has someone told you something after you promise not to repeat it? Does that happen? Sure. It happens all the time. How many times have you repeated the bit of juicy gossip? Who could it possibly hurt? No one will know. You made the other person promise not to swear, to t I mean swear not to tell, but they do. You did. Hebrews 4.12 refers to our tongue as a two-edged sword. A commentary notes that the tongue can be used to lift someone up and to tear someone down. It can be used to rant for the sake of anger and frustration. It can also be used to educate someone despite your frustration. It is the words you choose to use, the attitude you instill. Words, once spoken, can never be taken back, even when you don't really mean it. The childhood rhyme of sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is pure foolishness, bravado, emptiness. Words do hurt. Words cause more pain and long-lasting trauma than any broken bone. Bones can heal. The pain and fractured trust <coughs> resulting from words may never heal. Ernie, again, is an example. With me, he has blossomed in hell. He is absolutely loving, yet he cannot trust anyone else. He is needy. He needs reassurance and kindness, kindness constantly. He is the result of a deep wound that cannot be physically healed. Why do we hurt each other? That's the question that I struggle with. What does it gain to cut someone else down? Does making someone cry make you feel more superior? It shouldn't. And yet I see it every day. Teens are especially vulnerable to harsh words and whispered gossip, both in giving and in receiving. They seem to thrive on drama and not care who gets hurt. Thus the social media attacks we'll hear about. I've told students numerous times that when you post something on the internet, you might as well be standing on top of your roof or in the middle of Main Street, stark naked, screaming it out for everyone to hear. You are conspicuous, vulnerable, and whatever it was you said will never, never go away. It cannot be called back. Even if taken down or deleted, it is still there roaming around in cyberspace. Now, it is a scientific fact that teens' brains have not yet fully developed. Sorry, guys. 
<laughs> they will not have full development of the frontal lobe until they're in their 20s. And even, even then, some take a little longer than others, <laughs> especially the males of the species. <laughs> Which is the reason for increased insurance rates for teen drivers. They tend to take risks. They act before they think. They may have this excuse for some of the trouble they get themselves into, both physically and socially. Yet adults do not have this excuse. And yet adults still hurt each other. Apparently some people never do fully grow a forebrain. A couple of years ago, I had a horrible year at work. I will not go into details, but we, the special education department, was caught in the middle of a vicious situation in which we had absolutely no control over. We were being used as a tool against another person. As a result, nothing we did was right. We had to redo, ask for revision, even re-art almost everything. I could not trust the people having us redo the paperwork. I came to the point that I did not trust myself and felt that no one trusted me either. I made mistakes, nothing horribly serious, clerical errors. But still, I made mistakes that should not have been made, and all because I was so overwrought with stress and insecurity. We were totally under siege. To survive, I went into over-control mode. I wanted to do all the paperwork and to be personally in charge of the details, which morphed into too much responsibility more stress, more problems such as stress eating and gaining back weight I never wanted to see again. My sleep was affected, increased my activities. My mood was one of hopelessness, and my sense of self was diminished. Life was not all that great. Things changed at last as the year ended, and there was a change in personnel, not on our campus, but on the bullying end of the situation, and it truly was bullying. Yet damage was done. The only answer? I can come up with for the type of betrayal and damage that was accomplished that year is pure and simple sin. Teens can possibly partly blame their immature frontal lobe, but adults, there is nothing or no one to blame for the choices that they themselves make and for the allowing of <coughs> sin to direct their lives instead of God. I found another statement on Facebook that caught my attention. Everything you do is based on the choices you make. It's not your parents, your past relations, your job, the economy, the weather, an argument, or your age that is to blame. You and only you are responsible for every decision and choice you make, period. We have the choice to be trustworthy or to not be. We have the choice to build others up and be a benefit to humanity are to tear down and destroy lives. We also have the choice of accepting Jesus as our Savior and living the life that God wants for us or turning our backs on salvation. That is the thing about free will. We have it. It is ours to use. But one thing that we have to realize and that a lot of people don't or won't is that we are only here temporarily. There is an afterlife. In this afterlife, you will either be with God or without God. Yeah. It is your choice. God wants us to come to Him freely, with open, Christ-centered hearts, willing to set aside a life of sin and strife and embrace a life with Him. Colossians 3, 7-10 through 10 and 12-14 through 14 remind us that you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, let the Lord forgive you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. If only we would treat each other as God intends us to. If we were to show kindness instead of malice, patience instead of indignant frustration, and love, instead of hate or ill will. 
God wants the best for us, but we have to be willing to be obedient to God's Word and Jesus' teachings. We have to be willing to do our part. We can know that without a doubt that God is stronger than any problem, stronger than unfaithful people, deceitful, self-centered people. God is stronger than addiction, stronger than disease, and ultimately stronger than death. God <coughs> triumphs over all. And all we have to do is have faith and trust. All we have to do is accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on that wretched Roman cross. All we have to do is turn over our fragile trust to the one who is above all, who will never let us down, who is God of all forever and evermore. Then we can fully know what John was telling us in 1 John 4, 4 through 21. And this is the scriptural verse if y'all want to acknowledge it. You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves us has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only, his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Christ is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Amen. You may be seated. God is love. Whoever lives in God lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are, Je we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears <clears throat> is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. That was the end of the scripture. So, love one another, build one another up, wherever you are and under whatever circumstances you are in. The problem, however enormous, is temporary. Let God handle it. The person who is lost and filled with darkness, show them the way through your actions to the light of Christ. The world which is frightening and stress stressful, know that God is in control. All problems are temporary. And physically, our lives are temporary here on earth. We can look forward to one day going home to be surrounded by pure love, for such is God's promise to us, that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We have a song, hymn of invitation, just as I am. Can we change that to trust and obey?
as you are able to 467 it just seemed to <coughs> that makes sense Angela and we'll sing all four verses